In this lecture, we're going to continue with uh, chapter 10 covering sections 3 through 5. We're going to look at rotational kinematics as well as relating angular and linear quantities. Okay, so a record rotating about a vertical axis that coincides uh, with the axis of the spindle. Right, so in this first uh, image here, you can see just a record spinning around the center axis that's going in a clockwise direction. So we can use the right-hand rule to uh, figure out what the direction of the angular velocity is. Um, and it's actually, we show that on the z-axis. So what you're going to do is you're going to take your right hand, and it has to be your right hand, and you're going to rotate it around the axis as shown here. You're going to rotate it around the axis, so you're going to curl your finger around the axis. Now, the direction of your thumb is going to show you the direction of the angular velocity, which is omega. All right, so in this case, if we curl our right hand around the axis, as, sh as shown here, uh, our thumb has to be pointing in the downward direction, which is going to be the negative z direction. So we would say that the direction of our angular velocity is in the negative z direction, or if we use unit vector notation, it's going to be the negative k hat direction. Okay. All right, so let's uh, look at our, our constant acceleration equations when we're talking about rotation. Now this chart here shows you the correlation between the linear equation and the angular equation. And really all we're doing is taking the linear equations and we're replacing our linear terms with our angular terms. The equations work out uh, the exact same, um, except we're just looking at angular quantities. So for instance, let's look at the first one. This equation is our linear equation uh, for the final velocity we're going to replace each linear term with an angular term. So we're going to take our final uh, linear velocity and that's going to turn into our final angular velocity. Our final or our initial linear speed is going to be our uh, initial angular speed. Our linear acceleration is going to be alpha, our angular acceleration. And of course time just stays the same, so we're not going to change time. All right, and then so on and so forth. So you get all of these kinematic equations that you can now use um, in angular terms. All right, so let's go ahead and do an example problem. All right, so we measure rotation by using this reference line as shown here. Uh, we know that a negative rotation is going to be clockwise, so in this direction that would be negative, and in the counterclockwise rotation that would be positive. All right, so the grindstone rotates at a constant angular acceleration of alpha is equal to 0.35 radians a second squared. At time t is equal to zero, it has an angular velocity of omega naught is equal to negative 4.6 radians a second, and a reference line on it um, is horizontal uh, at the angular position of theta is equal to zero. All right, so at theta is equal to zero, your angular speed is gonna be negative 4.6 radians a second. All right, so what time after t is equal to zero is the reference line at the angular position theta is equal to five revolutions? All right, so we're trying to figure out at what time um, is the position of this reference line five revolutions? All right, so we'll, what we can do is find the equation that works for us. We see what we're given. So we're given our initial speed. We're given our acceleration. Right. We know what our initial time is, but we don't know what the final time is, so we're trying to figure out what the final time is. And we know the position. It starts at theta is equal to zero, and we're trying to figure out what the position, or, or what the time is when the position is five revolutions. All right, so we're going to look at our equations, and we see that the one that has all of these is this equation. So it's our final theta minus our initial theta is equal to omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared. All right, now also we're given our theta in revolutions. When using these equations, it's best to keep everything in radians uh, and then our, our standard units, so meters, seconds, uh, that kind of thing. So we want to convert our five revolutions into 10 pi radians. Oops. Because we know that one revolution is two pi radians, so five revolutions is going to be, oops, this is going to be 10 pi radians, sorry. Okay, so now we can plug this information into our equation. 
All right, we know that the left-hand side, the final position, is going to be 10 pi radians minus 0, because that was our initial position, is equal to omega naught, which we're given as negative 4.6 radians a second times time, plus 1 half times alpha, which is our acceleration. So that's 0 0.35 radians a second squared and then times t squared. All right, so now you'll see that we have a quadratic equation. We have a t squared term, a t term, and then a t to the zero term, right? So we can rearrange this in, in a form, and then we can solve the quadratic. And what we end up with for t is equal to 32 seconds. All right, so part b is asking us to describe the grindstone's rotation between t is equal to zero and t is equal to 32 seconds. All right, so the wheel is going to be initially rotating in the negative or the clockwise direction with an angular, or angular velocity of 4.6 radians a second. All right, that's one of the initial conditions that they gave us. But its angular acceleration is positive, which means it's going to be slowing down in the negative direction and then eventually stopping momentarily and then increasing in speed. So its initial opposite sign means its angular velocity and angular acceleration means that the wheel slows in its rotation in the negative direction, stops and then reverses, like it says. So after the reference line comes back through its initial orientation of theta is equal to zero, the wheel turns an additional five revolutions by the time t is equal to 32 seconds. All right, so at what time t does the grindstone momentarily stop? All right, so we're going to calculate with omega <coughs> is equal to zero, right, because that's when it's going, this would be our final omega, right? When the angular speed is zero, that's when it's going to momentarily stop. So we want to use this condition to solve the problem. All right, so we find an equation that works again, and that's going to be omega final is equal to our initial speed plus our acceleration, uh, our angular acceleration times time. All right, so omega f is equal to omega naught plus alpha t. All right, so again, we're trying to find the time here that it momentarily stops. So we're solving for t, so we'll just rearrange this for t is equal to omega final minus omega naught divided by alpha. All right, so that's equal to our final uh, angular speed we know needs to be zero, so that's going to be zero minus, and then our initial is negative 4.6, oops, radians a second, and this is divided by our acceleration, which is 0 0.35 radians a second squared. It's equal to 13 seconds. All right, so at time t is equal to 0, the disk is going to be rotating at 4.6 radians a second squared clockwise. Then it's slowing down, and at 13 seconds it momentarily stops, and then it starts spinning in the other direction, in the counterclockwise direction, until at 32 seconds later, you get five revolutions. All right. So relating linear and angular variables. Uh, so if a reference line on a rigid body rotates through an angle theta, a point within the body at a position r from the rotation axis. So let's draw this out. So if this is our distance r away from the rotation axis, right? And then we, have, of course, have some reference line that we're using. Um, the axis moves a distance s along a circular arc. So if we go from this position to this position, we're sweeping out an angle of theta, and this distance here, which is our arc length, is going to be s, right, which is the linear distance that it travels. All right, so this is going to be given by s is equal to theta times r, right, which is a radian measure. All right, so make sure our theta is in radians again. Right, so really we're taking our angle and multiplying it by r and that gives us our arc length. All right, our arc length which is s. So we'll just call this arc length. All right, so we're relating our our angular distance which we call theta to our linear distance which we call s. And notice we do that by just simply multiplying by r. So differentiating, differentiating this equation with respect to time and holding r constant, because around a circle r would be constant. So we take the derivative of both sides of this. You have the derivative of s dt, 
is equal to the derivative of theta dt times r. Well, we know that this term is going to be our velocity, right? This is just the, if this was an x, I mean, it's just the um, derivative of the displacement. Uh, with respect to time. So we know that rate of change is, is simply going to be our velocity. And d theta dt is our angular velocity. Right, so you get omega times r. Alright, so we found out how to relate our, our distances together, our angular distance to our linear distance. Now we can see we can relate our angular velocity to our linear velocity. Again, simply by multiplying by r. Okay, so the period of revolution, t, for the motion at each point uh, and for the rigid body itself is given by, and we, see, we saw this in the previous chapters, 2 pi r divided by the velocity. All right, if I simply replace this v with omega r, you get that our period is equal to, uh, it's going to be 2 pi divided by omega. All right, so the period of rotation, the amount of time it takes for one full rotation is going to be 2 pi times omega. Or excuse me, 2 pi divided by omega. All right, so continuing on, um, if we differentiate our velocity equation, which again was given as this, we take the derivative of both sides again. So this is dv dt is equal to d omega dt, and then r is constant, so we'll just leave that alone. This we know is our acceleration, and this d omega dt is our, ang or our uh, angular acceleration. All right, so this is alpha, and then times r. Right, so again, all we have to do to get our linear term is multiply the angular term by r. Okay, so this is going to be what we call the tangential acceleration, and I'm going to put a sub t there. Um, that means that it's the, the linear acceleration at the edge of a circle. So it's this acceleration as shown up here. Now there's also the uh, radial acceleration, right? This inward acceleration. We also know this as our centripetal acceleration. So AR is also really our centripetal acceleration. Um, it's the acceleration that goes towards the center of, of the circle, the center of the rotation axis. Okay, um, So we can take our centripetal acceleration equation, I'll just say AR is equal to V squared over R, which we saw again in the previous chapter, and replace V with omega R. And then we're going to square that, of course. So this ends up being just omega squared R. So our acceleration is also omega squared r. So this is our radial acceleration, or again, our centripetal acceleration. They're the same thing in this case. Okay. All right, so let's do an example. All right, so con consider an induction roller coaster, which can be accelerated by magnetic forces even on a horizontal track. All right, so this is a horizontal track. We're sort of looking at the bird's eye view, looking down on it. So each passenger is to leave the loading point with acceleration of g along the horizontal track. So at this point, uh, we want the acceleration to be g. So at, as we go through here, the acceleration, um, the tangential acceleration is g. Um, the first section of the track forms a circular arc so that the passenger also experiences a centripetal acceleration as the passenger accelerates along the arc the magnitude of the centripetal acceleration increases alarmingly. So when the magnitude um, A of the net acceleration reaches 4G at some point P, the angle, this angle here, uh, along the arc, um, the passenger moves in a straight line and then along a tangent to the arc. All right, so basically once you get up to 4G, you get to this horizontal part right here and then you start going straight. So what angle alpha p, should the arc sub subtend so that, a, um, so that a is 4g at point p. So right here, we want the total acceleration to be 4g. So the total acceleration, of course, is just going to be the two accelerations um, squared because they're going to be uh, 90 degrees from each other. Right? So we can take our tangential acceleration plus our radial acceleration. And again, to show this, so if you had a point here, 
this is our radial acceleration, this is our tangential acceleration, they're going to be at 90 degrees from each other at all times. Okay. All right, so first thing we can do is find a kinematic equation, given the information that we do know, um, and see if we can relate our radial acceleration, total acceleration, uh, and tangential acceleration. So let's start with this equation. So omega f squared is equal to omega naught plus 2 alpha omega f minus omega naught. Okay. Now we know that initially they're starting at zero. So our angular speed initially is going to be zero and our initial position is going to be zero. All right, so those terms kind of cancel out. What we're left with is omega f squared is equal to 2 alpha times the final theta. However, we know that this angular uh, acceleration is, is related to the tangential acceleration, right, which is what we kind of end up needing, or that which is what we need to find eventually. All right, so if we take alpha is equal to um, at divided by r, and plug that into here, you get 2 times alpha, oops, not alpha, but at, divided by r, uh, times theta, the angle. All right, so we have an equation for this final um, angular uh, angular speed, angular velocity. Well, we have another equation that we can use that is separate that we could actually get rid of this angular velocity, right? Because we don't we don't know anything about it. We kind of want to get rid of it. We also know that our acceleration, our centripetal acceleration, or the radial acceleration, is equal to omega squared times r. So what I can do is take this, which is omega squared, and plug it into here, and that gets rid of our omega squared. So our, our radial acceleration is going to be equal to 2 times our tangential acceleration times our final angle. Okay, so now we have our radial acceleration and our tangential acceleration related to each other. Um, <clears throat> what we need to find now is our total acceleration. Right, I showed you that in that equation up there. So this is just going to be the square root of our tangential acceleration plus our radial acceleration squared. We already know what our radial acceleration is, so we can take this and plug it into here. That'll get rid of uh, a variable for us. So that's going to be our tangential acceleration squared plus... 2 times our tangential acceleration times theta squared. Okay. So at this point, uh, we, we really want to solve for theta. I mean, that's the end goal, is to find out what this angle is. So we can take this equation and solve for theta. Now, it gets a little bit messy, but it's not too bad. We want to take the square root of both sides, and then we want to get theta uh, by itself. So when we do that, our theta is equal to 1 half times the square root of a squared divided by a t squared. So this is our total acceleration. This is our tangential acceleration, minus 1. OK. And now we can plug in the values that we know. So we do know that the total acceleration needs to be 4g once you get to point p. All right, so this is going to be 4g squared. That's our total acceleration. We know that our tangential acceleration is only g. Right, so that's just going to be g squared. And then there's a minus 1 there. All right, so you plug these values in. g, of course, is going to be 9.8 meters a second squared. So you get a theta that is 1.94 radians, or approximately equal to 111 degrees. Okay, so that is it for this lecture. We will pick it up next time.